So quantum mechanics describes the behavior of electrons in atoms. We just learned that electrons exist within orbitals, these wave functions. Um, an electron configuration is a shorthand description of which orbitals in an atom are actually, actually occupied by electrons. So hydrogen is very simple. It only has one electron. And so the electron configuration for hydrogen is 1s1. So 1 is the principal quantum number, n. n equals 1. s comes from l equals 0. And the superscript 1 here is just saying how many electrons are in that orbital. Well, it's just 1. So you can do calculations with Schrodinger's equation. And those show that hydrogen's one electron is going to occupy the lowest energy orbital in the atom unless it takes in energy and gets excited. You can solve Schrodinger's equation for hydrogen. For multiple electron atoms, it cannot be exactly solved. We can just get approximations. The reason for this is now we have electrons interacting with each other. That makes things very complicated. But the approximate solutions that we come up with show that those orbitals are similar to the orbitals in hydrogen that we can define better. So two of the things that complicate this uh, for multi-electron atoms are electron spin and energy splitting of sublevels. We'll talk about that. Let's talk about electron spin. So we have we can describe where the electrons are using electron configurations or using orbital diagrams. Orbital diagrams being a diagram are more visual. Here's the orbital diagram for hydrogen. Um, the box represents a single orbital, and we write what it is under here. This is the 1s orbital. And then we show the electrons as arrows. So here's an arrow. It just has half of a head. Not exactly sure why, but we just use half arrows. The orbital diagram indicates the spin of the electron. It can be plus one half, which we represent as up, or minus one half, which we represent as down, arrow pointing down. Now, if you took a bunch of hydrogen atoms and checked the spin of the electrons in them, roughly half of them would be spin up and half of them would be spin down. It's pretty much 50-50 there. The Pauli exclusion principle says no two electrons in an atom may have the same four quantum numbers. Now, you could have two electrons in the same orbital having three identical quantum numbers, but then the spins have to be different. So you can have two, two electrons in an orbital, but if that's the case, they have to have opposite spins. So each electron has its own set of four quantum numbers. It's like a unique identifier, almost like your social security number, right? It belongs to one person only. There are other people in the country, but they all have different numbers, right? So each, each atom, I'm sorry, each electron has its own set of four quantum numbers. Um, so in the S sublevel, there's only one orbital, so there can only be two electrons. Each orbital can hold two electrons. The P sublevel has three different orbitals. They're arranged in space, right? Each can hold two electrons, so there's six electrons possible there. The D with five orbitals can hold 10 electrons. The F sublevel has seven orbitals, so it can hold 14 electrons. And notice this is odd numbers, one, three, five, seven. And then just double those. So let's look at helium. Helium has two electrons. Its electron configuration would be 1s2, because those two electrons could both be in the 1s orbital. The orbital diagram, we'd show the box, one box for the 1s orbital, and we'd show one electron pointing up and one pointing down, because they have to have opposite spins. 
Here's a table showing their quantum numbers. They both have n equals 1, l equals 0, m sub l equals 0, because they're in the same orbital. But what's different is their spin. One's plus 1 half, one is minus 1 half. So they have unique sets of numbers. In hydrogen, the sublevels in a given principal energy level all have the same energy. Um, we say those are degenerate. Degenerate means orbitals with the same energy. In multi electron atoms, though, the energy of the sublevels gets split. They're not degenerate anymore. And this is due to charge interaction, to shielding of the nucleus, and penetration. So, in general, the lower the value of L, the lower the energy. So in a given principal energy level, um, S would be the lowest, then P, and then D, and F sublevel would have the highest energy. Coulomb's law is um, a great thing to know. Um, it can really help us to understand Um, what's going on with charges? This is this is a mistake. Those are supposed to be subscripts. Coulomb's law describes the relationship between potential energy and the charges of the particles and how far apart they are. So the energy is equal to this constant times Q1 Q2, Q2 over R. The constant we, we're not really going to use, so we can say the energy is proportional to Q1, the charge on one, times Q2, the charge on the other, divided by R, the distance between the charges. If R is smaller, the potential energy is larger. And you, you can observe this with a magnet in your refrigerator. Stick the magnet on the fridge, great, sticks fine. You put one piece of paper up there, you put the magnet, it's all good. You keep adding pieces of paper, what does that do? It makes the magnet be further away from the refrigerator. It's increasing R. At some point, the magnet's not gonna hold the paper up anymore. How many pieces of paper you can stick in there depends on how strong the magnets are. Here we're talking about electrical charges. Um, so if the charges are larger, then the force of attraction is greater. If the charges are smaller, the force of attraction is weaker. If these two charges are the same, then the potential energy is positive, that's pushing away. If the one is negative and one is positive, then they're attracted to each other. That causes the, the potential energy to be negative, it decreases as the particles get closer together. So we've, in a multi-electron atom, which is everything but hydrogen, we've got attraction between the nucleus and the electrons, and then we have repulsion between the electrons, because all the electrons are negative, and so they repel each other. Those repulsions can cause an electron to have a reduced attraction to the nucleus. It can shield the nucleus so that you can't really benefit from all of its positive charge. And so the amount of attraction that an electron actually feels for the nucleus is called the effective nuclear charge. Z is the atomic number, it's the number of protons in the nucleus. The effective nuclear charge takes into account that there's other electrons around that are getting in the way. and we'll get to a picture in just a minute. Um, the closer the electron is to the nucleus, the more attraction it experiences. Right? That's the distance between the charges. So if an electron that's normally farther away is able to penetrate into the inner cloud of the other electrons, it's gonna be closer and it's gonna have larger attraction for the nucleus. The how much it penetrates is, is related to the radial distribution function. Okay, so here's our picture. 
So let's talk about shielding first. So here, this would be what? Lithium, three protons, and three electrons. So these two electrons are in the first principal energy level in the 1s orbital, and they're going to be closer to the nucleus than this one, which is going to be in the second principal energy level. And so as this electron views the nucleus, these two guys are in the way. Now, we've drawn them here as particles, but they're waves, right? And so they're really occupying this whole space. So these two negative charges are getting in the way of this electron seeing this positive three. So essentially, these two are canceling out two of the positive charges. And the effective nuclear charge for this one is approximately plus one. That's not as attracted to the nucleus as these guys are. This one has nothing between it. It's experiencing the full attractive force of the nucleus. So that's an effect of shielding. If that electron that's in that 2s level is able to penetrate in and come in and be closer, then it's going to experience the full plus 3 charge. And so that would be a lower energy than the one that doesn't have that. So here we have um, the radial probability distribution. So this is the 1s, so we cut it off because it goes way high. So those are the, um, those two electrons in the middle that are shielding the next electron from the nucleus. The 2s orbital is this red one here, and it's got a node and then this lump in here. This part is penetrating into the 1s orbital space. So the electron being in here can get the full attractive force of the nucleus. The p orbital penetrates as well, but not as much. And so the p orbital is not as attracted to the nucleus. Because of this, the 2s is at a slightly lower energy level than the 2p sublevel, because the 2s orbital can penetrate in and get more attractive force. The 2p electrons are more shielded. Any questions? So the sublevels in each principal level are not all at the same energy. They're not degenerate. And then when you get to the fourth and fifth levels, um, things get so wonky that the 3d is higher in, le in energy than the 4s. It's all kind of crazy. And you know, just to add to it, the relative energy ordering can actually be different among different elements. We're going to ignore that part. And we're just going to look at them all as being the same. So this is a general energy ordering for multi-electron atoms. So the 1s sublevel is the lowest, and there's 2s. And the 2p is a little bit higher. There's three orbitals, so each line is representing an orbital. Those three orbitals are at the same energy. But they're a little higher in energy than the s because the s was able to penetrate in closer, and it's got more attractive force. Then we have 3s, and there's 3p. And this is where things get a little wonky. We would expect that 3d would be next because that's still in the third principal level. But the 4s is actually because of penetration again, it's able to get in closer, and so it's got lower energy. And then 3D and 4P and 5S and 4D, and it gets all messy. I'm going to show you how you can find the ordering on the periodic table. I'm not going to worry about that just yet. So as the electrons are occupying orbitals in an atom, they're going to do so in a way that minimizes the energy. This is like you know, things go to lower potential energy. You put a, a rock on the side of a hill and it's going to roll down to the lowest point. The electrons are going to fill the atom to have the lowest energy possible. So it's going to fill the lower energy orbitals first. Um, again, there's, there's a list of the filling order. We're not going to worry about that just yet. 
we need to remember that orbitals can hold no more than two electrons each. And the Pauli exclusion principle says the spins have to be opposite. Then we have another rule called Hund's rule. Um, if you're filling degenerate orbitals, like those p orbitals that all have the same energy, put the electrons in each one singly first with parallel spins, and then pair them up. Okay, so all of that is very abstract and difficult to get your brain around. So I have an analogy that I call the quantum hotel. It's a discount resort for electrons, in Mrs. K's chemistry land. Chemistry land is this imaginary place where, you know, I see gas molecules moving around like a pong game and all kinds of other crazy things. It's just in my head. It's a very, very strange place, but, you know, this is where the quantum hotel came from. So, the electrons in an atom are like people staying in a strange hotel. So this hotel has um, different floors. So the first floor has one room, the second floor has two rooms, the third floor has three rooms. As you go up in floors, you get more rooms. Kind of weird. The floors of the hotel correspond to the principal shell or principal energy level for the electrons. So the first floor is n equals one. The second floor is n equals two. So the rooms are labeled S, P, D, F. So each room is a subshell in the atom. The, um, the S rooms, doesn't matter what floor you're on, S rooms always have one bed, P rooms have three beds, D rooms have five beds, and F rooms have seven beds. The beds correspond to orbitals. So a P subshell in the electron in quantum mechanics has three orbitals, right? So the P room has three beds. Each bed can hold two people, like each orbital can hold two electrons. So person's like an electron, and money is like energy. So that first floor, that 1S room, it doesn't cost as much to stay in the 1S room. So somebody coming in and getting their choice of any room, they're gonna choose the cheapest one because this is a discount resort. Everybody here is trying to save money. So they're gonna take the cheapest room they can. And then there's a rule that you can only have two people per bed and the people must have opposite spins. I've interpreted that differently over the years. Um, what I come up with ultimately, which uh, seems to be the best. So here's a bed, right? So spin is how you sleep in the bed. It's really, this is the headboard. That's not very good. So the first person comes in and they're gonna sleep right side up in the bed. Not sure why, but I think of electrons as being masculine. Um, so think of a couple of guys Maybe, maybe the whole class, we're going to some conference and we're gonna stay in a hotel overnight and it's double occupancy, right? There's a single bed and two of you guys have to sleep in that room. Is that gonna be great? That'd be creepy and weird, right? Guys don't like to sleep with guys they don't really know. That's weird. Women are a lot more open about that. We don't necessarily like it, but we're not gonna sleep on the floor because of it. So. These are guys, right? But you can't sleep on the floor. I don't know, they have some sensor or something. They'll find out, they'll kick you out, I don't know. So the, the other guy comes in and he's gonna sleep upside down in the bed. He's gonna sleep with his head at the other end. No funny business going on here. I'm not gonna accidentally, you know, spoon with you in the middle of the night. We're just gonna, we're just sleeping here, okay? So that's what the guy, what, that's what they do. This is the electron spin up, and this is the electron spin down, okay? So let's go back to this ordering and talk about how the electrons would fill in here as people coming into the hotel. So 
people are coming in and they're going to stay in the hotel. And the first electron gets there and he wants the cheapest room. So he's going to stay in the, on the, in the 1S room. He's going to sleep right side up in the bed. Next electron comes in. Again, these are cheapskates going for lowest cost. He's going to take the other place in that room, even though he has to share the bed with this guy, but he's going to sleep upside down. Next electron comes in. It's going to cost more money. Well, don't have a choice, so he goes in here. And then the next electron, well, I'll sleep upside down in that room to save money. So now we get to the second floor P room. And the first guy goes in here. He's like, well, I'm tired. I'm just going to take this first, first bed by the door. Next electron comes in. So guy coming into a room. There's one guy sleeping in this bed, and there's two empty beds. Where's he going to go? He's going to take his own bed, right? That makes sense. And that's what Hun's rule says. They will occupy their own orbital with parallel spins. He's got his choice of how he's going to sleep in the bed. He's going to sleep the regular way. I mean, who wouldn't? Well, my son Andrew wouldn't, but he's different. So the next electron comes in. There's an available bed. He's going to take it. That's how electrons fill the orbitals. Now the next one comes in, doesn't want to pay for a more expensive room, so he's got to pair up with somebody. So he's going to, well, I'll sleep here. The next guy comes in, sleeps there and there. Next one comes in, we take this room. And then the next one's going to pair up. We get here to the 3P, and again, the second guy coming into that room is going to take his own bed, and the third guy. And then they have to pair up. You get the idea? Oops. <laughs> Sorry. I, I'm zoomed in too far. I couldn't see. Uh, they're not going to go to the 4P room because the 3D room's cheaper. So they're going to go in. And now the fourth guy doesn't have to share because there's another bed. And then the next guy, there's another bed. And they're not going to pair up until they have to. Okay? That's the quantum hotel. So, electron configurations. So, unless it says that it's an excited state or that it's an ion or some other thing, unless it says something special, we're going to assume that when it says electron configuration, we're talking about the ground state, the lowest energy. This is all of those electrons in their lowest energy places. An excited state in the hotel would be a guy went, um, gambling at one of the casinos and he won a jackpot, and he comes in, he's like, um, I'm going to stay in that room way up there tonight. But he can't stay up there eventually forever because he runs out of money. So is this like a castle, like when you go on a door and one car and you set a lot of things for that? Is it like a carpool? Um, I'm not sure. You do save energy when you have, have people. So I guess you could say that they're, they're saving energy by being in the same sublevel together. Yeah. Um, the number of electrons in a neutral atom is equal to its atomic number. Just a reminder. So if we were looking at nickel, nickel is element 28. It's got 28 protons. That means it has 28 electrons. If you've got a charge on it, then you add or subtract electrons. Um, if you're wondering, how do electrons hang out together? How can you have two electrons in, a, in the same orbital? When they have opposite spins, they're able to be close together. Um, each orbital can hold a maximum of two electrons, blah, blah, blah. So the electron configuration is just a list of the sublevels in the order of filling, indicating the number of electrons in each sublevel written as a superscript. 
So this is a little bit like the, the front desk clerk, and he needs to keep track of which rooms are occupied and how many people are in there so that when the next person comes in, he doesn't send him to a room that's full, right? So 1S2, 2S2, 2P6, 3S2, 3P6, 4S2, 3D10, 4P6. So Krypton has 36 electrons. And if we went through and, and filled 36 electrons in this diagram, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 22, 22, 24, 26, 28, 30, 32, 34, 36. We get full up to 4p. And in this 4p, there would be six electrons. So here we see all of these lower ones are full up to 4p. And 4p has six. Now that can get a little tedious. You know, you get these bigger atoms with lots of electrons and it just goes on and on and on. So there was a shorthand, it's called the inner electron configuration or a noble gas configuration. So if we look at rubidium, rubidium has 37 electrons. So this is its electron configuration. But if you look, this part here is the same as that, right? They all start out the same and they just, you just add electrons on, and so they are different in the number of electrons, but the way they fill up is the same. So this is the same as krypton, so instead of writing that big mess, I'm going to write krypton in brackets, and that represents the electron configuration of krypton, 5s1. You can only do that with noble gases. You can't just pick the previous element and, and do it that way, that, just noble gases. You should be able to write electron configurations the full written out way and as a noble gas configuration. I really like orbital diagrams because it looks a lot more like the hotel, right? So let's just look at carbon. Carbon has six electrons. Um, in the orbital diagrams, instead of arranging them vertically in order of increasing energy, we, we arrange them horizontally. And so the 1s is cheaper than the 2s, and the 2p is the most expensive room for the electrons to stay in. So as six electrons come to stay in this hotel, one goes here, the second one's sleeping upside down. Next most expensive room, guy sleeping right, the right way in the bed and the wrong way in the bed. And then the next one gets his own bed in the in the 2p room and then the last guy comes in and he also gets his own bed and there's an empty bed here but there's that's how six electrons would occupy the orbitals now in a hotel if there's no one staying on the third floor are those rooms still there or do they disappear when nobody's in them they're still there right it's just that nobody's in them. So 2p orbital, is there a 3s orbital up here? Yeah. We just didn't draw it because there's nobody in there, and so we don't need to look at it. But it is there, and if we shocked this atom, we could bump one of these electrons up into a higher energy orbital. But we'd have to put energy in. Later, that electron would move back down and it would release energy as electromagnetic radiation. Write the orbital diagram for argon and determine the number of unpaired electrons. So we need some boxes. So on the first floor there's one, one room. On the second floor there's two rooms. There's the S room and there's a P room. The P room has three beds. And then the third floor, there's an S room and a P room. There's also a D room, but we're not going to need that. I know because I've done this before. And again, we'll get into 
how you predict the order in the next lecture. So how many electrons does argon have? 18. Okay, so I'm going to fill these in and I'm going to count because otherwise I lose track. So one, two, three, four, five. Next guy's going to take his own. Six, seven. Now they have to pair up. Eight, nine, ten. Now we move up. Eleven, twelve, thirteen. He gets his own. Fourteen, fifteen. Now they have to pair up. Sixteen, seventeen, eighteen. So that's the orbital diagram. It says determine the number of unpaired electrons. Are any of those guys sleeping by themselves in the bed? No, they're all paired up. Looking at an orbital diagram, we can tell whether there are unpaired electrons or not. The electron configuration doesn't show us that. Once you have the orbital diagram, it's very easy to do the electron configuration. So 1s, and I'm like, well, how many electrons are in there? Two. And next is 2s. 2s, there's two electrons in there. Next is the 2p room, and in that room, there's three beds and there's six electrons. And then 3s, and there's two electrons staying in that room. And then 3p, and there's six electrons. So the electron configuration is just looking at the different sublevels, the different rooms. It's not concerned with the individual orbitals or the individual beds and how many are in each bed or anything like that. Yeah, so what would, the, what would the noble gas one be for this? Well, argon is a noble gas, so we can't just do argon in brackets because that would kind of be cheating. So we go to the previous noble gas, which would be neon. And neon corresponds to this part. So neon, 3s2, 3p6, that would be the same as argon. The electron configuration, if you add all the superscripts, 2 plus 2 is 4, plus 6 is 10, plus 2 is 12, plus 6 is 18. The superscripts should add up to the number of electrons. Here we would take neon is 10, has 10 electrons, plus 2 and 6 is 18. Any other questions?